sometimes been described as being quietly confident. I often get described as being determined. My family will tell you that I'm stubborn. My good friend Cy Sparks often tells me that I am a stubborn little... Another good friend, Paul Renshaw, once told me that the only reason I'm here today is because I am the most belligerent he knows. So this is how my good friends and family think of me. Thanks, I guess. Um, but I, I'll be honest, I feel slightly misunderstood. And uh, I was chatting to another friend about this um, just the other week, and he said, John, how can anyone misunderstand someone as blunt as you? But they do. The current recruiting slogan for the Royal Marines is, it's a state of mind. But 15 years ago when I joined, it was 99.9% .9 need not apply. And people regularly used to tell me why I need not apply. But I stand here today having successfully completed Royal Marines Commando Young Officer Training when I was 19, having passed the Royal Marines Mountain Leader Course, which is even tougher than Commando Training when I was 23, having survived standing on a bomb and losing three limbs, having built my own house, having completed the devices to Westminster kayak race with only one arm, having kept myself successfully self-employed for the last four years, having got through 17 surgeries in the past three years, and over the past five years having twice been instrumental in changing government policy. So, what's the secret? How do you force your heart and nerve and sinew to do their turn long after you are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing left in you except the will which says to them, hold on? That's something we're going to explore now. Because you're probably all sitting there thinking, wow, this guy's pretty arrogant, given that list. But actually, the reality is I'm not. I suffer a lot from uh, a lack of self-confidence. The reason I tell you all of those things is actually to make you realise what is possible. You see, I have very little in the way of natural talent. And that's why for all of that list, at least one person, and in most cases many people, would tell me that I wouldn't be able to achieve it. Yet I did. I did have one talent, and that was a talent they all knew about, but they all massively misunderstood. Has anyone in the room got any clue what that might be? It was being stubborn. So what is being stubborn? Um, the Oxford Dictionary tells us that it's having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something especially in spite of good reasons to do so. Now, for me, that position is my ability to achieve whatever it is that I've set my mind to. But the most important part, I think, about that definition is the in spite of good reasons to do so. There will always be people who give you good reasons to change your position. Or in other words, give up. So I asked, what's the secret? For me, I propose that that secret is belief. Running sub four minute miles is now standard in international middle distance running. But 64 years ago, for most people, it was seen as an unbreakable barrier. And it's the same in most athletic records or human achievements. Once people know that something is possible, then they're just simply able to go and do it. But what is it that sets the trailblazers and record breakers apart? Where do they get their belief from? I wonder if it's down to meticulous planning. I wonder if Sir David Brailsford's remarks about the British cycling team's success, where he said that it was due to specially round wheels on their bikes, was actually less of a joke and more of a reference to the level of detail and perfection he was willing to go to in every aspect of his team's performance. You see, I think what trailbreakers do is they see their targets 
and they break them down into small achievable steps. And then once they've seen those steps laid out in front of them, it simply doesn't make sense for them to give up. This is something that I've always done. But on that way, there's always going to be some pain and discomfort. I'm sure you've all had endeavours like this in the past, where you're testing yourself. And the way that I've always dealt with that pain and discomfort is actually to plan for it. I plan for it, and then I embrace it. Because I know that when I feel that pain, it's giving me confidence that I am actually on track. So, what am I saying? I'm saying, don't just be stubborn like a mule, be smart like a human. Set yourself targets, break them down into achievable steps, plan for where the pain and discomfort will be, and go for it in full confidence. This is what I've always done, and it's what I love helping other people achieve now. So, I've talked about how I go about being stubborn, very methodical process there. Um, but actually what I want to do now is describe to you how that stubbornness has helped me over the years. You see, I, um, I meet people all the time and I tell them what I've been through and um, they always ask, you know, how do you cope with post-traumatic stress disorder? And when I say to them, well, actually I've never suffered with PTSD, they always look at me in disbelief and just say, I, I can't believe that, it can't be possible. Now, I can't say with any certainty what it is that has protected me from PTSD, but I do have a couple of theories. Um, the first is to do with my memory. I've, um, I've recreated the memory of those events into something that I'm comfortable with. And the memory I use of being blown up and the subsequent 40 minutes of consciousness, I have no idea whether it's accurate or not. What I've done is I've taken some images in my head and I've mixed them with the stories that the men on the ground with me have told me and I've created what I describe as a kind of storyboard, this mixture of images and silent movies and then next to that I have my voice as a narrative explaining what's going, what's going on. And I've retold this story, this um, this memory over and over again in many talks and so what's happened now is that is absolutely well entrenched into my mind and that's what I feel comfortable with. Secondly, my determination to prove to other people and myself that I was able to physically cope with these injuries meant that what I needed to do was plan my own recovery meticulously and as, as I set myself ever more challenging um, targets and then applied myself to achieving them, what I found is I was too busy to actually sit back and dwell on what would have been at the time probably more accurate and possibly far more horrific memories. And then eventually those memories were just forgotten. And also what happened was, in having all those small achievements, I got to the stage where all of a sudden my, my life was back to normal again. And in fact, it wasn't just back to normal, my life was great. And I still really clearly remember the moment in 2012, two years after the explosion, I was sitting by a turquoise river in the mountains of Montenegro, uh, doing some anchoring work. And um, I was asked the question, you know, remember a time when you felt really powerful? And I'd done work like this before, but in this moment, it was the first time I ever thought of myself post-injury. And that was the moment where I realised that I no longer needed to regret my past. Um, and because I didn't need to regret it, I no longer needed to dwell on it too. So again, it just helped me forget those worst memories. Um, here's a word of warning about all of this though. Um, we need to find empathy for those around us because not everyone will understand what it is you're doing. They won't understand your plan. And this is something that I've learned from personal experience. You see, 
I didn't think that anyone else was allowed to be affected by my injuries. Um, they were mine to own. And so when my family, my friends, my wife were struggling to deal with my injuries more than I was, I couldn't understand this. And it made me really angry, not explosively angry, that's not really in my nature, but um, what I did is I tended to shut down some of those relationships a bit um, and ended up doing quite a lot of damage to them. And that's something that I'm really trying to repair now, so I'm deeply sorry about. So you're probably sitting there thinking, well that's all great John, but it's easier said than done. And you're right, it's not easy. And it's not for everyone. Not everyone can just be stubborn and determined in the way they go about uh, dealing with mental health issues. There's lots of other options out there, like we've heard tonight, whether it be seeing counsellors, talking to friends, meditation or sport. The point is, you need to find something that works for you. So four things to finish with. Firstly, what we need to do is decide that we want to have positive intentions. And when you make that decision, you need to vanquish negative thoughts. And this is something that took me a real conscious effort to do at first. But then it became habit, and now I'm happy to say it is my nature. Secondly, we need to set ourselves challenging targets. Reverse engineer them into achievable steps, plan where the pain is, and go for it with confidence. Thirdly, don't get mad when people can't see your plan and don't understand what it is you're going through. They're just trying to work it all, all out too. And equally, if you think that someone's just being stubborn, maybe sit back and wonder whether you're just not understanding their plan fully. And then finally, the next time someone calls you stubborn, maybe try taking it as a compliment instead. Thank you. Thank you.